I'm Jean-Pierre Reval, I'm a physicist. China has to multiply by three the amount of installed electric power between now and 2030, and this is to reach a level of two kilowatt of energy per inhabitant, which is still very low compared to, to what we have here in, uh, in, in, in Europe and in particular in Switzerland. So, uh, you know, th those people, they want to live a little bit like we live. They want to have a fridge, a TV, a computer, a car and so forth, and, and they need energy to develop. And uh, I don't see why we should tell them uh, don't do that because that bothers us that you have to uh, uh, you know, to burn so much coal, and uh, they are, you know, uh, getting in great trouble because of pollution. Not only CO2 release in the atmosphere, which is in itself a total disaster, but <coughs> also chemical, uh, chemical pollution. We have more and more people uh, dying of chemical uh, po pollution uh, effects uh, in the world, and that will increase with, as the consumption of, uh, of coal is increasing. It's, really uh, criminal to not do anything serious uh, to avoid the release of CO2. Uh, I saw some uh, numbers uh, that uh, uh, between uh, 2010 and 2012 the coal consumption in the world has increased by 20 percent. Uh, this is uh, catastrophic news for the planet. A lot of people who are environmentally minded are probably aware of that, but the common response I hear is, well, we should deploy more uh, windmills and more uh, solar panels. Yeah, be my guest. Uh, suppose you have 20% uh, of your energy coming from uh, wind power, and suppose you're in 2011 in Germany, when suddenly, for some uh, reasons of uh, instability of the, uh, of the weather, there were 20, 42 consecutive days without wind. So what do you do to replace 20 or 30 percent of your electricity uh, by something else? If, when the wind doesn't blow, you don't have it. So you need to have something else. And people have to understand that to exploit, um, you know, re uh, renewable resources in an optimum way, you have to have something else together with it so that when the wind doesn't blow, you can turn on something else. And this is what uh, Carlo Rubia is proposing with this uh, ADS. With the accelerator, you can tune the uh, power of the system to, to follow your needs. And the sun, you know, sometimes doesn't shine, in particular in the middle of the night, usually, you know, unless you're... Uh, you know, uh, beyond the uh, polar circle or something like that. And, and there, the conditions are not very favorable because the, the, the sunlight comes at a non very favorable angle. So uh, you cannot, you have to be realistic. Uh, everybody is, is in favor of developing renewable energies, but in practice, in order to do that in an optimum way, you need to have something else. Now, if the something else comes from coal, I think this is very, very bad. So what people are doing here in this conference is try to uh, discuss ways of doing it uh, otherwise. And uh, nuclear energy based on thorium instead of uranium is extremely promising because it doesn't have all the problems of the uh, present nuclear energy. Uh, it works perfectly well on paper. We understand the physics of accelerator-driven system perfectly well. There were dedicated experiments at CERN to verify all the physics. So now it's just a question of uh, uh, building a real system. And we already know that uh, elements of the, the, the such systems already exist and have been operated. There is an accelerator at the Paul Scherer Institute in, in, in Switzerland that has achieved a beam power which is sufficient to do this. There is also in the same institute there was a test uh, of, a, of a target for the beam. That means that you know, the, the protons have to hit a piece of lead to, to make neutrons because we need neutrons to sustain uh, nuclear reactions. And the target of a one megawatt power was designed, uh, tested, and it worked perfectly well. So we already have the basic elements of the systems. I see no reasons why uh, we should not build it, because it's only a matter of rearranging existing technologies. There are, of course, some, some uh, small developments to be made to, to <coughs> optimize the, all the elements of the system, uh, work on their integration, and so forth. 
I'm not saying that uh, there, there is no more work to be done, but at least all the conceptual part uh, is well understood. Can you uh, describe to me uh, what the main benefits of ADS over existing conventional power? Well, well could, could I get you to say why you think we need to move beyond today's reactors as a start before you bring up what's better about ADS? There is a practical reason the, the, the world population doesn't want those reactors. Uh, here in Switzerland, they, the, the people of Switzerland voted uh, a law that uh, says that uh, Switzerland should stop all the power plants and, and do something else because people are afraid of nuclear power plants because they were accidents and so they are, they are afraid. Of course, uh, you know, they, um, you have to understand that some political parties are, are using uh, people fears to, you know, push their agenda. Uh, for instance, uh, with the Fukushima, acci uh, the Fukushima accident, uh, you know, green parties really uh, uh, got it made because they, uh, you know, they had, uh, they wrote articles everywhere saying how terrible is Fukushima. Actually, if you look at the number of casualties in Fukushima, it's not very large. It's a handful of people who, who were irradiated, and it's of course terrible. But you can put that in perspective. With there are 10,000 people dying in coal mines each year. Uh, what it, it, it's a very big number. So you know we could maybe avoid all that by stopping using coal, for example. So why don't we also ask? Um, you know, society to stop using coal because coal is killing a lot more people, not only inside the mine, but also people who die of uh, lung cancer because of the, the pollution that you, you get by burning coal, in addition to releasing CO2. So if, the, if some legislation has been passed saying that uh, Sweden is going to not use nuclear power, um, how does that let ADS, what is AD, how does ADS work? Because I would have defined ADS as... So ADS is a different way of using uh, nuclear power using thorium instead of uranium and uh, ADS has the potential for uh, meeting all the requirements of society and those requirements are threefold. There is the possibility of accidents, there is the uh, what you do with the waste that you produce and then there is military proliferation and, and uh, nuclear energy based on thorium uh, would be acceptable from the, this point of view. What is it that thorium is bringing to the table with ADS that uranium would not already have been bringing to the table? Well, uh, thorium, because of, the, of, of its nature and because of the, the physics of, uh, of, of uh, neutron interactions with, with uh, all the elements, is such that it produces a lot less waste than uh, the um, uranium, just because it, it, it takes seven neutron captures to go from thorium-232 to plutonium-239. So each of those captures has a small probability, so if you multiply seven times uh, small probabilities, then you get a very, very small number. So the first advantage of thorium is that the production of nuclear waste is much, much smaller. However, if thorium could be used in the same way we use uranium in nuclear power plants, then it would be easy. We just would replace uranium by thorium. Unfortunately, you cannot do that because when you replace uranium by thorium, uh, you have two problems. First, thorium-232 uh, does not fission. So you have to put the thorium in a neutron flux to produce uranium-233, which is then your fuel. So you have to find a way to go from thorium, which does not produce energy, to uranium-233 that produces energy. This process is s slow because the, the intermediate uh, product is the protactinium-233, which has a half-life of one month, and that's ten times <coughs> longer than the equivalent element in the uranium chain, which is neptunium-239. And because of that, and the fact that thorium has a tendency to capture more neutrons than uh, uranium-238, uh, if you prepare a system with, uh, with, with thorium, and even if you add already some uranium-233 to start with, the system will stop very quickly because you don't produce neutrons fast enough. 
So thorium has uh, that problem that uh, it doesn't work in standard power plants based on uranium. Therefore, you have to do something else. Well, what you can do in view of this is maybe uh, make sure you always have fresh fuel, because if you put fresh fuel with a uh, uranium-233 plus thorium, or you could even use the plutonium-239 for this purpose to get the thing started, uh, it, it would stop very quickly. So, but if you continuously put fresh fuel in the system, that it can uh, continue uh, working. And uh, there are two ways of doing that, even three. There are things called pebble bed detectors, where the fuel is in uh, some spheres of uh, uh, some uh, carbide uh, uh, alloy that uh, contains the, the thing that uh, can fission. And then you, you can uh, make those spheres circulate in the system, so you always have new fresh uh, fuel in the thing. The other possibility is to circulate the fuel as a liquid, and that's the famous uh, molten salt uh, systems that uh, uh, many people are working on. And the third way is, instead of uh, making always fresh fuel, is to just add the neutrons that are missing. As you wait for the protactinium-233 to decay into uranium-233, you can inject uh, few, uh, the, the missing neutrons with an accelerator, sending a beam on, uh, let's say, a lead target and emitting neutrons. So that's the idea of ADS, is to provide the missing neutrons that can make the system work with thorium instead of uranium. Can you describe all the features of an accelerator-driven system uh, beyond supplying neutrons? So in a practical sense, um, what does that get us? I mean, we've got thorium... Then, then, uh, then you can even forget for a moment that those neutrons come from an accelerator and then it, it's like a standard system and it works. And right. that's what we, uh, Carlo Rubia and his group did at CERN. They actually simulated all this in detail. And they verified that the simulation was correct in making two dedicated experiments. We took the, the beam, actually, from the uh, proton synchrotron of CERN, sent it on an uh, assembly of natural uranium with a, a target in the middle. So the beam hit the target, produced neutrons, and we uh, verified that the whole chain from the proton in the beam all the way to the energy produced in the system was well understood, and it worked exactly as predicted by the simulation. Therefore, we have really verified that this thing is extremely well understood. Whether ADS is offering us uh, uh, safety benefits? Yeah, in terms of safety, the system is subcritical. That means the multiplication uh, uh, coefficient uh, that the uh, specialist called K usually, K is smaller than one, which means as soon as you stop the beam, the system stops. So no problem with the accidents like in Chernobyl where you had a criticality accident. Chernobyl was a criticality accident, yeah. Fukushima was not. Fukushima was not, it was, uh, Fukushima was an accident that occurred after the power station was shut down because once you've shut down the power station you still have to take care of the uh, heat that is produced in the system by the fission fragments, you know, you, you break big nuclei of uh, uranium in, in, in pieces and those pieces are unstable and they, they decay into other elements by emitting uh, gamma radiation or, and other things and that, that produces heat in the system and you have to also take care of this heat. It, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, uh, it decays with time but uh, after some time it's of the order of 6-7% of the of the power of the system, so it's not negligible. And in Fukushima, this uh, heat removal was, uh, was done uh, using pumps, and the pumps failed. In fact, it's not the pump that failed, is there was no more power to run the pumps, therefore it's, uh, it's the same, the pump stopped, and there was no extraction of heat, so the temperature w went up and the core melted. So the question is, can this happen with the, with the um, with an accelerator-driven system? And the answer is no, because the system can be designed in such a way, and this is, I think, one of the very important contributions of Rubia, is, is you can make this cooling process natural, like a chimney. You can arrange to have a, uh, air circulating around the core, 
so that the cooling occurs by natural convection of air. It was actually developed in the United States, this thing. It's called AirVax, and it has been envisaged in the Uni United States for standard nuclear power plant. So if you have a cooling that works without pumps, and if there are no pumps, they cannot fail. And that's uh, really a very important feature of the system. So you, you have to also use the intelligence of people designing those things to make it safe. And this is why you need a prototype, a demonstrator of a significant power to adjust all those things in such a way that uh, you will optimize the safety uh, aspect of the system. Could you define HLC for me and then define what a hadron... What is HLC? Oh, LHC. Sorry. Oh yeah, LHC is the, the jewel of CERN, it's the Large Hadron Collider, the most powerful accelerator in the world, the one that allowed the greatest discovery of particle physics in, in a long, long time, the Higgs particle. And uh, that accelerator is a very uh, high energy accelerator. Each beam will eventually reach 7,000 GV, uh, that means 7 TV. And uh, when the, these two beams of 7 TV collide, that will be 14 TV of energy available in the center of mass of the colliding system. Uh, you, know, the, you, can, you know that energy and mass are, are the same thing. Uh, we learned that from Mr. Einstein. So to give you a scale, a proton has a mass of about 1, one GV, so 14 1,000 GV is would be the energy equivalent to 14,000 protons. So it's a fantastic energy. It has never been achieved before. And, uh, you know, we are very proud at CERN to, to have uh, contributed to, uh, uh, to the, you know, the, the development, uh, the approval and the construction of all those systems. When I talk in a general way, I, I did not work on the accelerator myself. I, I'm, worked on one of the experiments, I'm working on the ALICE experiment, but uh, I think it's a major achievement and I think we, we are quite proud of uh, this type of achievement. However, now to come back to ADS, we don't need the LHC for ADS. We made another very interesting experiment here, which uh, uh, Carlo Rubia proposed, which was called FIT, the first energy amplifier test, where, uh, where we measured the neutron produced as a function of the energy of the beam to find out what is the optimum energy and we discovered that the optimum energy is very low it's 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 one gv of the order of one gv so it's a it's a seven thousand seven thousand times smaller than the energy of uh, the lhc beam and therefore it's a small machine already at uh, the paul scherer institute there is a machine with uh, essentially 0.6 GV, which is in operations. We already have plenty of machines in the world which uh, can achieve 1 GV. And uh, so we know for sure that that we can know, we can do. Could you define hadron for me? A hadron is a particle that can feel the strong interaction. You know, there are four interactions in nature. There is the electromagnetic interaction, that's the uh, the things you know that uh, is related to electricity, for example, is dominated by uh, particles which have uh, a charge, an electric charge, like electrons. So we call it electromagnetic interaction. There is the weak interaction, that's, uh, like, that's the one involving beta decay. Uh, uh, that's also the one that uh, makes our sun shine. And uh, there is the strong interaction, which is the interaction that keeps the nucleons bound together inside the nucleus. Protons and neutrons stay inside the, the nucleus because they are kept together by the strong interaction. And then there, the fourth interaction is the gravitational force, the, the thing that keeps our feet on the ground when we walk around. So you can, uh, you can trigger fission with either a proton or a neutron and those... Yeah, you need neutrons. So in a certain sense, it doesn't matter how you make those neutrons, but then you want to do it in an efficient way. And I think the simplest thing to get a high intensity beam is with protons, because protons are the nuclei of hydrogen atoms. There is plenty of hydrogen. So at CERN, they do that routinely. You take hydrogen, you strip away the electron, and then you have a proton. And uh, so it's the easiest thing to do. That's why we use proton. 
So even if you had a weak beam of protons, but you're never firing the weak beam of protons directly at the thorium fuel, you're always... No, no, you, you, you have to uh, also uh, make an intelligent design. You have to uh, put your target in the, in the center of the core, hit it with the beam, and then the protons are produced. And in the energy amplifier proposed by Carlo Rubia, uh, the whole thing is immersed is in molten lead, so the protons, they move in lead. And lead is very good because it does not eat the protons very quick, the neutrons very quickly. So the neutrons can wander around and hit the fuel and produce fissions. Can you tell me why you don't think the molten salt reactor is uh, as safe as the proponents would say? What are your safety concerns with? First of all, the, the system does not exist. It's, it's on paper. So, uh, you know, I cannot make a statement uh, on safety of something that does not exist. I can only say that there are a number of issues that have to be addressed. And if people manage to address these issue in a satisfactory way, then that will be great. But I know they are extremely difficult issues. You have to extract of the core part of the fuel while it's still very hot. So that's, that's a problem of normal radiation, but you know that the fission products emit neutrons. In fact, uh, th 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 there is an emission of neutron that takes some time. It, takes, it can take uh, up to minutes. And those neutrons, in fact, are extremely useful in standard nuclear systems because they are called uh, delayed neutrons and, and they are used to actually uh, control and drive the system. Because they, they are emitted uh, with a delay, that gives you time to adjust uh, control rods uh, and 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 uh, and um, react. Uh, you know, if uh, suddenly the reactivity is too high, you in, you insert more control rods in the system. If if it's too low, you extract them, and that can be done uh, at a certain speed, but not too fast. So those delayed neutrons are extremely important in, in standard system because those are the neutrons that allow you to. To, to control the system. For uranium-235, it's 0.65% uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the neutrons are uh, emitted this way. So when you extract this fuel outside the core, not only do you get the uh, radioactivity of the standard decays and things like that, but you also get these neutrons and that irradiates everything. That's one of the main headaches in fusion is to take care of irradiation by neutrons. So that's problem number one. Problem number two, you have to deal with corrosions of those salts. You have to make sure your chemistry online works to extract the things that you want to extract, the fission products and uh, eventually the protactinium. You have to make sure this loop doesn't stop uh, for some time because if it stops, the part of the fuel outside the system will cool. When you send it back into the system, it will lower the temperature. And uh, since a well-designed nuclear system should have a negative temperature coefficient, which is part of safety, if you lower the temperature, the reactivity goes up. So if you lower too much the temperature, your system can become super critical. So all those issues have to, have to be met. Furthermore, there will be uh, difficulties with the, the uh, certification of such system because certainly uh, some of the laws will have to be changed if uh, people really want to do it because nowadays there is a, a certain number of concepts of uh, uh, confinement barriers that will have to be uh, modified because obviously extracting the fuel out of the system uh, violates uh, one of the confinement barriers so there will be a lot of administrative steps but let's hope that th those things can be solved if one day people are so uh, you know uh, nervous about uh, not getting enough uh, electric power that they, they might accept uh, those type of things. But uh, those systems will be very difficult to, to develop. So when you were talking about the um, reduced waste be with thorium because uh, it's producing less of less plutonium. So when I mention that to people in sort of the green movement, they the slightly more technically savvy guys say, well, it still produces the same quantity of waste because there's still the same amount of fission products. Now can you maybe tell me how you view fission products? Okay, so there are two components in nuclear waste. There is the fission products, that means you break a, a big uh, uranium nucleus into two 
and and those pieces of um, uh, these new nuclei are uh, not stable they decay and they produce uh, radioactivity however most of them are very uh, short lifetime that means you wait a little bit the radioactivity disappears but there are a few of them which have a, a significant uh, lifetime and uh, typically 30 years so uh, uh, you have to wait longer now you know a lifetime the half life is is uh, a quantity that physicists use to say how long does it take so that half of the nuclei will have disappeared. And uh, so if you have a half-life of 30 years, uh, after, uh, after 300 years you have uh, 10 half-lives, so it's 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, 10 times, and essentially you, you, you have uh, almost nothing left. And, uh, so the radioactivity of fission products is initially the same as in a uranium system, but uh, like in the uranium system, after a few hundred years, all this thing is gone, all this radioactivity is gone. And therefore, it's not such a big thing. If you compare to the radioactivity of the other component of the waste, which we, uh, we call uh, actinide, that, uh, all the trans-uranium uh, elements produce, which have things that can last a million years. So you have to put in perspective a few hundred years with a million years. I know today how to build a, a container that will last three or four hundred years. I don't think I know how to build something that I can guarantee will last a million years. And that's where uh, the ADS comes in, because with the ADS you can destroy this component of the uh, of the nuclear waste that has a long lifetime. And I don't think the fission products are the issue. It's a very small quantity compared to the waste that society uh, has to recycle all the time in other areas which have nothing to do with nuclear energy. I mean, we are talking about relatively small quantity that you have to, to keep uh, safe for a few hundred years. And uh, I suppose that a lot of waste from uh, um, coal has an infinite half-life, like it's it doesn't disappear, oh, well, it just stays around you know, forever. I think we, we think that uh, given uh, the appropriate techniques to extract the, 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 this long-lived uh, waste out of the system, uh, we could make sure that the radioactivity of what is left is uh, below the radioactivity of, uh, of coal ashes. You know, Professor Rubia uh, calculated how may, uh, much coal ashes uh, contain in terms of uranium and, and thorium. And uh, it's interesting that you get, uh, if you take the coal ashes of a system, and if you would extract the uranium and the thorium, you could run a nuclear power plant that would produce a lot more energy than the energy that was produced to produce the coal ashes from coal. So. Um, I, I, nobody proposed today, and you can ask the green people whether we should stop burning coal because of uh, the radioactivity of coal ashes. So if I have make a system where I can tell you after some time the radioactivity of the waste will be b below that of coal ashes corresponding to the uh, same uh, produced energy, uh, I don't see why we should say uh, it's not acceptable because we accept it for burning coal. That's excellent. Um, could you do me an introduction? On what? Introduce yourself and say what you do. Ah. I'm Jean-Pierre Reval. I'm a physicist. Uh, I got uh, an engineering degree in the École Nationale Supérieure des Arts et Métiers in France. Uh, I got uh, the equivalent, I, I think it's called a master degree these days in mathematics from the University of Paris. Paris 6, and then I went to MIT where I got a, a PhD with uh, Professor Ulrich Becker uh, working in the group of uh, Professor uh, Samuel Ting in the uh, Laboratory for Nuclear Science, and so I did my PhD with, uh, in that group, and then I, become, I became a faculty at MIT. I joined the UA1 experiment with Carlo Rubia that got him the uh, that got him the um, Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of W and Z particles. And before that, I was fortunate to work with uh, Professor 
thing and uh, contribute to, to an experiment that discovered the gluon at, at DAISY. So I'm uh, very proud of having uh, participated in two experiments where we made uh, two major discoveries. The, this is evidence for the existence of gluons, which are the carrier of the strong force. <coughs> and then at CERN, the discovery of the W and Z particles. And then after that, I've been, uh, <coughs> after my time at MIT, I was, uh, um, I became scientific advisor of the director general of CERN, who happened to be Carlo Rubia. After which I worked with him on the energy amplifier and I did with him these experiments at the CERN PS that uh, uh, validated all the conceptual uh, uh, you know, ideas of, of the system that Carlo Rubia proposed. Yeah, so, so after I've done these experiments with Carlo Rubia, uh, I joined the ALICE experiment and I've been in charge of the uh, CERN team in ALICE for almost 10 years. And uh, recently, that means on 1st of September, I uh, retired from CERN because I reached the age of 65. So now I'm retired from CERN and I'm uh, thinking again uh, about contributing to uh, the uh, accelerator-driven systems development to promote the R&D on thorium for those systems. So um, with a number of people here in Geneva, we created a new international association called ITEC for International Thorium Energy Committee. And this uh, association is a non-for-profit association with the purpose of promoting R&D on thorium. And uh, presently, I'm the president of uh, that association. I've heard the molten salt reactor defined as the chemist's reactor and it seems where there are challenging chemistry problems, you know, material science is bringing a lot of chemistry to the table to try to solve these problems, whereas it seems to me like ADS is a physicist trying to solve problems. Do you think that there is any truth to that? Well, uh, it's a mix of all those things. I mean, if you want to design uh, an experiment at CERN, you have a chemistry problem, you have a electronics problem, a mechanical problems, uh, computing problems and so forth. And in fact, I think that what makes the success of CERN is that at CERN you find expertise in all areas that are relevant to what you want to do. And therefore, when you have, when, when you, you want to do something and then you find out you have a problem with chemistry, then you turn to the chemist to help you with that and you put all those people to collaborate together. And this is what we do routinely at CERN. So if you want to design a molten salt system, obviously you have to have chemists working with the nuclear people. They cannot work separately. So uh, what is really the question about that? It's more of a taking a step back and see how the fuel is going to be reprocessed where um, there's a lot of molten salt, I believe, involved in the reprocessing of spent fuel when you've got it in a solid uh, form. So ADS is using solid fuel, um, which is just being hit by the new... Yeah, ADS is a lot simpler from that, uh, from that point of view. We don't extract the, the, the fuel from the core while it's running, and then the, the fuel is a more conventional things. It could be oxide fuel. In fact, thorium oxide is very good. It, it, can uh, withstand a very, very high temperature and things like that. The reprocessing, we have some ideas, is to use a process that was actually initially developed at Argonne National Lab in the US, which is called pyroelectro reprocessing, which seems to simplify a lot the chemistry. So yes, we need chemists as well, but uh, not at, uh, at the same level as uh, as a chemistry that should be online and in fact you know coming back to molten salt reactors is the one of the challenges is to ensure that this chemistry online will work with not fail and, and so forth uh, but yes uh, we in all complex systems you have to work with the specialists of different fields and the chemists are certainly uh, part of, of what is needed i interpret the chemistry of the AD system as being very similar to the today's reactors, like 
chemistry-wise, it doesn't seem like there's any. I, I mean, I don't know what you mean by similar, but uh, today's reactor, they use water, we use molten lead. The uh, nuclear industry wants to, to use uh, sodium, uh, molten sodium, uh, uh, and so forth. I think uh, molten lead is a very easy thing to, to handle. It has nice properties. Sodium, I would avoid. Even though this is what uh, nuclear industry is saying, uh, the next generation of a nuclear reactor will use uranium uh, in a system cooled with liquid sodium. Uh, you know, you take a little piece of, uh, of sodium in your hand and you put it in water and it explodes. So imagine several thousand tons of liquid sodium at Fukushima. People would not have dared putting uh, seawater on it. And uh, that would have been uh, a disaster on a totally different scale from the disaster that happened there. None of the, uh, the issues we, we have with chemistry in, in ADS is a, a difficult issue. It's a s standard, straightforward uh, chemistry issue. Well, I, I certainly don't see ADS introducing any new problems. Yeah, we don't need any, any specific things from uh, chemistry. The, there, I mean, there are areas, for instance, you know that People want to transform the heat produced in the system into electric power. Now, of course, you want to do it in the best possible way. And there is a, there is a physicist, Mr. Carnot, who has uh, studied thermodynamics a long time ago, who came up with a very simple observation. I mean, the efficiency of the transformation of heat into electric, electric power improves with increasing temperatures. So the, 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 the idea is to go to the highest possible temperature. A standard power plant now operates at 325 degrees, 300, uh, around 300 degrees, uh, and, and that means an efficiency of only 30%. So the new, for instance, nuclear power plant pressurized water reactors are very inefficient. They throw out into the environment twice as much energy as they convert into electric power, which is not good at all. So, it's obvious that what you want to do in the next generation of power plants is operate at the highest possible temperature. This temperature is limited by a number of things. The, 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 the structure you use, you have to make sure it doesn't melt uh, and so forth. And uh, the idea is to, to do that with, um, with lead. Uh, but lead has a nasty property at very high temperature. It, it, it starts becoming corrosive. So we also need chemists to uh, develop new material that uh, can withstand uh, lead corrosion. At this stage, I think there is a new material that was invented just uh, by people studying this in lead loops. They circulate lead in a loop and they vary the temperature and they test material and it's called Eurofair. It's a new steel that uh, behaves much better and I'm sure in the future uh, through all the R&D that uh, still has to be done uh, for, for ADS in particular, yeah, there will be innovations come in of uh, development of new materials that can, um, that can uh, you know, live in a high temperature lead. We can go to very high temperature because evaporation temperature of lead is like uh, something like uh, 1700 degrees, so we have a lot of margin. So, you know, if we could go to 1000 degrees, that would be fantastic. You will get uh, very high efficiency and so forth, and uh, you, you would not pollute the environment also with heat because you know what happens. You take the water from a river to to, to cool the things, and then uh, you release a lot of heat in the water, so you raise the temperature of the water. That also some kind of uh, interference with the environment. So the the more efficient you are, the better it is. So there is chemistry. There is. Uh, engineering, mechanics, uh, physics, uh, everything. Well, the, the chemistry that you're talking about seems like it's, it's exactly the same kind of uh, work you'd be doing whether or not there was an accelerator tied to the reactor or not. Yeah, yeah I mean, there are people uh, de trying to design a critical reactor uh, replacing the sodium by lead and uh, making it critical and it's certainly also possible so those people will come up with the same, uh, same kind of, uh, of demands. Any ADS challenges you're working on now? Like you're trying to make them less expensive, more reliable, and so we can, so it's easier to tie them into a reactor. But any challenges you're facing with ADS, they are not of a nature that chemists 
are really brought to bear on it, right? Look, I mean, if when you build this first system, the chemists tell you you can go to 550 degrees today, then we'll go to 550 degrees. It's already uh, much better than uh, 350 degrees. And that we know we can do. And then uh, the next, uh, after a few years, I suppose that, you know, the day, the day there is a decision to build such a system, you will see the R&D will pick up because many industry will want to be part of it. So they are going to come and say, hey, we develop a new steel that can go to 600 degrees. So then we'll take this one. And that's how, uh, um, you know, society makes progress. You realize that you could improve things. Once the innovation is made, you improve things. Look at computers today. They can do uh, fantastic things. When I came to CERN in the 70s, the CERN had the biggest computer in Europe. It was a Cray, I forgot the exact number. It was water-cooled. It was in the computing center, very impressive uh, piece of hardware. And, and uh, nowadays, uh, kids uh, playing with the PlayStation, they have uh, three or four times more power than the thing. You know, but once the computers exist, you, you can improve the technology, you have uh, better and better chips and things like that. It will be the same. We're not saying that the, the first day we'll, uh, we'll build uh, uh, the dream system, but we'll make a system that will work well enough that we can already do what we want to do. And then uh, it will improve with time as, uh, you know, R&D uh, gives us uh, better and better materials and so forth. And that applies to all the components of the systems. Look at the power plant. Uh, the, even if you take the standard nuclear energy, the power plants we have today, they don't uh, really uh, uh, you know, uh, look exactly the same as those the, 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 the Fermi pile that was the first one uh, made in 1942. And I guess even uh, Fukushima is an extremely dated reactor. Um, but it's, that was not the reason why there was an accident. You know, this is also something that the public should understand. People say, oh, it's an old reactor, but you know, a lot of the parts, they are uh, upgraded, they are exchanged and so forth. It's like the airplanes. You see this airplane? I mean, they, it, it, it still works after 10 or 15 years, but after 10 or 15 years, it's no longer the same airplane because people exchange parts and maintain, there's maintenance and so forth. So it, it's not true to say that a power station is more dangerous because it's old. I mean, it, it might be true for, for some of the aspects, but usually, I mean, you know, if the maintenance is done correctly, an old, power system should be, uh, uh, you know, as, uh, as uh, safe as, uh, as a new one. If it's not, then people should really stop it immediately. As ADS reliably, reliability improves and costs go down, what does that bring us um, outside of the realm of reactors? Like, the benefits, of, um, the benefits of developing ADS so that you can have ADS power systems what does that do for humans outside of... Well, the, the great thing is that, you know, uh, Carlo Rubia explained that there is uh, plenty of thorium if you only take one part in a thousand of the thorium in the Earth crust, then you could uh, run uh, uh, the world with the present uh, power, 15 tera uh, terawatt, for 20,000 years. So there is potential for uh, provi providing a lot of energy for a long time. And this energy is carbon free and I think you know if, if the world doesn't solve quickly the, the problem of, uh, of releasing CO2 in the atmospheres plus the other polluants then uh, we're in big trouble and I, I do not understand the ecologist attitude that now they say uh, global warming is okay you can burn more coal and, and more gas etc and they prefer stopping uh, power, uh, nuclear power stations uh, now, immediately, for political reason, uh, at the cost of uh, producing a lot more CO2 in the atmosphere. And they, this is the immediate cost. So you, you shut uh, a power station like the Mühlenberg uh, power station that will be shut down in 2019 in Switzerland. Okay, you have to use coal to produce 5% of the Swiss energy, so that releases a little bit more CO2. But what is even more dramatic is by not making the R&D that we should make now on thorium, we are not preparing 
uh, to face the major disaster that is coming from uh, China, India, Africa very soon, South America, the, all those countries which are developing and which need a lot more power than, than what we, we use here in Switzerland. So ADS would also deploy the negative coefficient of reactivity, negative temperature coefficient? Oh, temperature coefficient. Nobody will be allowed to, to make a system where if your reactivity goes up, you produce more power, the temperature goes up and the reactivity increases with temperature. We want the reactivity to decrease because you, you want the system to stop itself, you know, otherwise then you're doomed, it's a, it's a bomb. Okay, so you want the temp what, so people refer to this as temperature coefficient. If the temperature increase, the reactivity should decrease. So nobody will ever be allowed to build a system with a positive uh, temperature coefficient. Now, why isn't that in itself enough that ADS is also um, considered safer? Because ADS would deploy that, all reactors going right. forward would deploy that. Would you? I think in, in principle that should be enough uh, if you can make sure that the, uh, the, the, the system remains subcritical all the time, which is the case, excuse me. Uh, hello? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, in principle, if, if a system is um, as a positive coefficient, then uh, uh, it's, uh, clearly, nobody will, will build a critical system like this. Now, for subcritical system, as you pointed out, I mean, if you have another mechanism, but you see, people want things to be intrinsically safe. So I could say, if I see the temperature rise and my criticality rise at, at the same time, then I can switch off the beam. But I don't think that will be acceptable because people say, hey, and if there is nobody to switch off the beam, uh, you know. So let's build a system which are intrinsically safe, that the system, no matter if, even if, uh, you know, the hum humankind disappears, it, it will still uh, shut off uh, by itself. In fact, you know, in the BBC, there was an, artic uh, an article, I mean, uh, press release yesterday and they interviewed Carlo Rubia and he said the thorium system can shut down themselves and this is what you want. So the answer for your question is very simple. I w even though, you know, I could imagine running a system with a positive temperature coefficients, I think it would be crazy not to make a system uh, self, uh, I mean, intrinsically safe. So in your mind, uh, you can, you're using two ways of controlling the reaction. You can flip it off and it'll also naturally uh, control itself if it gets super critical. Yeah, I, th I think, uh, you know, if the temperature increases, th this thing should lower. Then you can, uh, you can uh, do what you want with it. You, you don't have to worry about it. But is, is the primary, the first thing you'd say when you're uh, describing the importance of ADS, is the first thing you'd come at people is say it's safe safety first. yeah safety first i mean the only reason people don't like nuclear energy is, is safety plus maybe the association with the military things because i think that gave a very bad image of nuclear energy the fact that people build bombs and actually drop some of those bombs on the head of a few uh, of, 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 of people in japan and things like that so the association with military is very bad but uh, then there is the accident, so people are afraid of those things because of safety, you know. This, uh, so uh, safety is the f should be the first concern, I think. Uh, the, and you know, if, if, if there is a probability of an accident, even if it's very small, that means that uh, it could happen one day, and if it happens, it could have uh, bad consequences. So you want to make sure that uh, the maximum uh, accident is still uh, a small thing that can be contained and will not, uh, not be a disaster. All right.